five minutes, okay. And if anyone uh, needs to go to the bathroom or you want, Debbie's packing up now, but if you need to go get something, you may, and whatever else you need to do. <laughs> All right, I'm nearly 30 years old, and my mom is improving my relationship with a young man I've been dating. He is a Christian as I am. She does everything out of her way to stop me from dating him, and she has strong convictions that he's unsaved. Am I being disobedient to my mom by continuing dating this young man? She doesn't give me valid reasons that he's unsaved. I think she may be holding on to me too tightly. Am I wrong? Well, there's a lot of information here I don't have. I don't know if there's a father in the picture, and so that makes a big difference. Um, but I would listen to your father and your mother. Um, I wished I had listened to my father and my mother when I was dating a man, and my dad told me to stop dating him, and I didn't. And uh, he ended up starting to physically abuse me, and after my husband and I got married, uh, he went to prison for 20 years, and uh, not for beating me, but um, <clears throat> anyway, and he claimed, I thought he was a Christian too. My dad kept saying, you, sh you know, Susie, I want you to stop dating him, and so uh, I would listen to your parents. They have a lot of insight and wisdom maybe you don't have, but I'd also appeal to them. You're 30 years old. I would ask why, maybe sit down, maybe they just don't know him well enough. Uh, if there's a father involved, you and your mother and your father need to sit down with this young man and maybe ask some questions. I know before my kids got married, uh, we had my son's fiance, um, you know, over for uh, several weeks and we got to know her. She stayed with us and same with him. He went out to Washington and stayed there. And so his, her parents got to know him. And before that, my son was dating a gal at the master's college and I, he asked me to spend some time with her, and I did. One day we were up there visiting, and uh, after spending a couple hours with her in the hotel room, I said, Charles, break up and break up fast. I said, this woman is, and she was at the master's college, and he did. He honored me, and about three or four months later, she was disciplined out of the school, so there were some serious issues there. So parents a lot of times have wisdom that we don't see as children, so if I could live my life over again, I would listen to my parents far more than I did. But I am not saying your fiancé or boyfriend's not saved. I don't know. I need a lot more information. So whoever this is, if you want to uh, email me when I get home, text me. If I'm delayed at Orlando, come see me in the airport. <laughs> I will have all kinds of time to answer your questions. Not that I have all the answers, believe me. Uh, Matthew 12 says you'll give an account for every careless word if... The, okay, sometimes I can't believe this. If a believer is saved by grace alone, will they also have it to give an account for their word? Well, Paul says uh, in not, uh, Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. We also are talked about, told in 1 Corinthians 7 that our works are going to be burned as by fire. So we're going to stand before the Lord, and there's some kind of accounting for our works. It could be attitudes. It could be motives. We are saved by faith alone through grace alone. We are going to stand before the Lord justified as if we have never sinned. That's how he looks at us now. But that doesn't mean there's no accounting <laughs> for our lives. And so we're going to give an account for everything we've done in our body, whether it's good or bad. Uh, so I can't just ignore those passages. Um, so I don't know how it all fleshes out. I'm not God, and I'm not in charge of the great right throne judgment. <laughs> but uh, we should live in holy fear, right? We should fear the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so, um, yeah, we are saved by faith through grace alone. And if you're saved, you're saved. You're not going to get lost. But that doesn't give you a king's X for words that you shouldn't speak, right? So, um, yeah, and there's a lot more I could say on that. Um, and when it means an accounting here, give an account for every careless word, Again, when we stand before the Lord and we give an account for everything done in our body, whether it's good or bad, that could include some words or things that we've done, deeds in our body. Okay, uh, what do you do with someone who like, and I really don't understand this question at all because I, I guess I'm just not in the know, I'm in, not in the loop. So uh, I don't know how I'm going to answer this question because I'm not really sure what's asking here. What do you do with someone who like the blacksmith means you and your family harm? How do you forgive these kinds of serious and detrimental tax? I'm not sure what blacksmith, blacksmith means. But for anyone that does uh, serious harm, uh, sexual abuse, child abuse, uh, rape, um, murder, uh, how do we forgive these kinds of serious and detrimental attacks? I think we forgive in the sense that we have to look back 
to the cross. We look at the one who's forgiven a lot. We look, I always give the example of Joseph. Uh, he was thrown in a pit. That was certainly abuse. Uh, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. That certainly was wrong. Uh, what his brothers did to him was wrong, but still he forgave. And we can forgive even the most horrific things that go on in our life because of the grace of God and because he has forgiven us. I, I, I'm not trying to de, uh, minimize the situation. I don't even know what the situation is. I would encourage you to find a good uh, friend, uh, someone that can help you through the scriptures, to work through the hurt, very difficult times in our life. And I can't explain things that have happened to me that I have been able to forgive others for. I can't explain it apart from the grace of God. He just gives me that ability to forgive the most horrific things. Um, I was talking to a gal in another state where I was speaking, and she came up to me after the conference. She was just in tears, and she was talking about before Christ. She was an, al an alcoholic, and uh, <clears throat> she was killed somebody when she was drinking and driving, and, she, of course, she was put into prison. And uh, she said, but the parents of the man she killed came to prison and shared the gospel with her, and she became a Christian. And she's now serving in prison ministries. And she said, but I just can't, it's hard for me to get over the fact that I killed somebody. And I said, but God, but God who is rich in mercy brought his parents there. They forgave you for killing their son. And then they shared the gospel, the son of Jesus Christ. So, or the son of God. So um, we're trying, to, I'm trying to help her with a little bit of that now. But we can, I don't know how you, I can't explain it. Because it's, it's not a natural thing to forgive. It, it's supernatural and it comes from God. And he, he does give us that ability. Okay, what if I don't want to reconcile? Avoidance is not forgiveness, but what if everything is fine as long as we avoid one another? Am I the one with no desire to reconcile? Yeah, I would say that's a problem. I don't think, you know, Jesus had three close friends, Peter, James, and John. He had 12 disciples, but he had three very close ones. And John, the disciple he loved. I don't think we have to be best friends with everybody in our church or our family or anything like that. But I do think that we're kind. Jesus was kind to the thankful and the, and the evil. Uh, we're to be kind to our enemies. We're to pray for our persecutors. And so uh, avoidance is not forgiveness. But I don't think that you, they have to be your chummy friends. But I still think you treat them with kindness and grace. My husband recently has been saying from the pulpit, we don't endure people. We encourage people. <laughs> So I've been very convicted. There's some people, you know, quite frankly, I think I endure. And, uh, but I need to encourage, not endure. And so I think we still keep trying to, to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And so uh, ask God to give you the grace to love this person. And again, it doesn't mean you have to be best buds. Um, but you do need to be kind and to behave as a believer. What is the most gracious way to... Repro approach a sister whom I love whose children are destructive and disobedient whenever they come to my house for a day. Uh, she seems unconcerned about the damage and messes they leave behind. Well, I've had that happen many times in my home. Um, we've had some interesting times through the years where we've had children that have climbed on the dining room table while we're eating, thrown uh, things at my grandfather clock, and one specific time, my husband said, we're having so-and-so for dinner, and I had never, never, never met so-and-so, so so-and-so so -so came over, had two children, and the, the one of them walked in my room, she goes, I want to eat, and I want to eat now. And I'm like, ooh, okay. <laughs> and I told my husband, I said, I don't ever want to have them over again. <laughs> So we've had things, in fact, one time we had some people over and I told the little boy to stop throwing things at my head alive, Benjamin Ficus in my home. And I said, you need to stop, stop throwing, because the parents weren't doing anything. And I said, please stop throwing those things at my plant. And he wouldn't. So my husband went over, grabbed him by his arm, whacked him a few times. I was like, oh boy. Uh, that's the end. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that's going to be the end of that friendship. But... Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. And they're still friends with us today. And our kids were the same age and we got together a lot, but he just, they, he wouldn't obey. So to answer the question, uh, don't spank their kids, but, um, <laughs> 
But I would, you need to admonish your friend. You really do. I would, I, whoever this is, I would admonish her. I would go through the principles in Proverbs. I would ask her if her, she hates her children. And if she says uh, no, I would say, yes, you do. You hate your son. That's what, that's what Proverbs says. He who spares the rod hates his son. You hate your son. And I would go through all the passages lovingly but kindly in Proverbs and Ephesians about parenting. Uh, you might need to get her a good parenting book. And, um, but I would just go through all that with her. And, and if they continue, you might have to limit the amount of time they come over, you know, if, they're, if the kids can't behave. And, and usually what I'll do, uh, I had a situation where I was babysitting somebody, and it didn't go well, and I told the mom what happened after she got there. And uh, she said, well, you have permission to spank her. And it wasn't good. And I, I told my kids when I started babysitting my grandkids, there, I want to I want to be a part, but let to know in our home these are the rules, and that might be a good thing when the kids come in say, you know, this is our home. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord, and so these are the rules while you all are here. And I want you to enjoy my home, but you really can't jump on the furniture and throw things at my grandfather clock, and you know, <laughs> things like that. So uh, that's that's challenging. And you know, I will say I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing in the church today with parenting. I, I am just appalled the things that I see in the church that would never have been allowed when I was growing up. Uh, that the, the disrespect, the disobedience, and parents do not do anything. They're ignoring it and not parenting their children. Ladies, we're going to be accountable for that. Um, we are to, to love, bring up our children in the nurture. That's encouragement and admonition, discipline. So you encourage, but you also discipline your children. Okay, I need wisdom on reconciling quickly but building trust if it's broken. Example in marriage, husband left but now open to possibly reconciling. Uh, you can reconcile, and I, I think building trust takes time. It doesn't come overnight, especially if there's been infidelity, adultery, something like that. Um, I, I do think you can reconcile, and marriages can be restored, uh, but I do think trust takes time. I don't think it happens overnight. Uh, you know, when Gomer committed adultery, Hosea uh, brought her back, but he built some boundaries <laughs> there. So uh, if your husband's got issues with pornography or adultery, I think there should be an accounting of his time. He might need to ditch his cell phone or whatever it takes. And so it takes time to build trust. So don't, um, don't be too concerned about that, but keep trying to build the trust that was broken but I think it, that'll be hard to do without accountability for him, just making sure he's doing the right thing. Um, how do we settle squabbles between non-believing family members for a relationship where there's unhealthy treatment? How do we approach uh, asking for forgiveness and loving them, even when hurt versus repeatedly? They hurt us repeatedly. Is it wrong to have no contact with them if we've tried to express our love for them and still receive hurtful treatment? Um, you know, we, we, my husband and I have both had these situations happen in our family. Um, there was a time his dad told him to divorce me <laughs> because I wasn't a fan. I wasn't a blood relative. Okay. That'd be weird if I was a blood relative, <laughs> but, um, and his dad was not a believer at that time. And so my husband cut off, we had to cut ties with him. He was, um, you know, he just basically said, I'm not going to support your um, going to seminary. I'm not going to fund it. He had already offered to fund Doug's seminary education. And he said, I'm not going to do that unless you divorce your wife. And so <laughs> Doug said, well, I'm not divorcing my wife. So anyway, um, so we cut off. There was a period of time. Uh, then with my own mother, who's now gone, uh, there was a time my husband had me cut off my relationship with her for about a year because she was just not, it was not wise. What she, she was doing, our phone conversations were not going in a God-honoring way, and he just asked me to hold off contact with her for a year, and I did. It was very difficult, but it did result in good things afterwards um, because she was, it was just not good how it was going. So I do think there are situations in families uh, where you might have a period of time where you have to just pull back. Uh, Jesus did. Sometimes he was uh, around his parents and his, his family, and other times he pulled back away from them. And so I think it takes wisdom, takes discernment, and might need some counseling in this. Talk to your pastor. Um, but there are times, I think, when we might have to and lovingly do it. Um, and I know it, it's hard, it's difficult, 
but sometimes for a while, a brief period of time, I think it might be wise. And it might be permanent, depending on what kind of things have gone on that you might have to. And of course, if anyone is uh, disciplined out of a church, you know, we're not to eat with such a one and not to fellowship. That was really hard. My, my, my sister-in-law was once disciplined out of our church, and uh, we had to sit down with my husband's mother and tell her why we couldn't come to Christmas and Thanksgiving. And that was really hard. She wasn't a Christian. She didn't understand it. And so, um, but anyway, we sat down with the Bible and tried to explain that to her. So family relationships are hard, right? Yes. A man's enemies or they have his own household. It's rough. How do you resolve a squabble with an unbeliever who continually pushes your buttons to speak, to spark confrontation? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Some women are, I don't know if it's a woman, but some, some and men can be like that too, but continually wants to push your buttons. Yeah, I, I've been around people like that. I personally, the way I handle that, um, I do try to love them and try not to avoid them, but I don't try to, I don't share a lot of things with them. I've learned and I've, I try to be gracious and kind, but I don't uh, cuddle up to them, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I just, I try to be, uh, you know, kind to them, but I I think we uh, we can, like the Bible says, flee you know, there's no temptation taking you, but such as common demand, but God is faithful, who will not permit you to be tempted above that you're able. And then it says flee. <laughs> so sometimes you just need to, you know, get, avoid the situation if you know that she is just, she or he is just going to try to push your buttons or if they're oversensitive or they just like to be divisive. It says, it says a man who's divisive, you get away from him. So if that's what they're doing, then I would limit my time with them. But I also would lovingly, I think you need to confront them, too, lovingly. Uh, you know, why are you doing this? seems like every time we get together, you just want to argue. You just want to, why? You're oversensitive. We need to and maybe try to help them. How do you deal with someone who's overly sensitive and easily offended? Well, there we go. I just answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down and talk with them. I, I do know people like that, and the, those kind of people are very hard to be around. And uh, you just might ask them, what, how come, have you ever wondered why you are so sensitive or do you ever wonder why you're so easily offended? It seems like, you know, we can't really talk without you being offended. Have you ever wondered why? Have you ever thought about looking in the Word and see what God says about this? And so maybe uh, you approach it that way. Okay, and these are all kind of on the same thing. What motivated you to memorize the New Testament? How long did it take? How can we memorize books of the Bible? How are you able to remember what you've memorized while working on other passages of Scripture? What is your plan? How do you do it? Et cetera. Okay, so these are all in scripture memory. Uh, what motivated me, I don't really know. My husband, uh, like I said, had most of the New Testament memorized when I met him. And so he asked me if I had anything memorized when we were dating. And I said, yeah, John 3.16, man. <laughs> I can quote it to you, too. And I also knew the Romans road, so I knew that. And uh, so anyway, he said, no, a book. Have you ever memorized a book? And I said, no, <laughs> no, a book of what? <laughs> a book of the Bible. So he encouraged me. He shared me his, with me his method, and I did memorize Colossians. I was 18. And then I didn't pick it up again until God saved me at the age of 30. And I think what motivated me was I just, I had a, and I still do, I have, it's actually my favorite spiritual discipline. I love memorizing scripture. I just, I've, there's so much insight into it, meditating on it all the time. It's, it's, I've gotten to know God in a way that I never could imagine. I'm able to help people, um, and I want to help women, and so I'm able to recall things to be able to help them. Um, so I guess the Lord put that burning in my heart, and I, I just want to keep memorizing. I love it. Um, how long did it take you? I started seriously at 30, and I finished the New Testament about a year and a half ago, and since then I've memorized Ecclesiastes, and I'm in, about to finish Genesis chapter 7, so I'm working through Genesis. Um, how can you memorize? I would encourage you, because a lot of these on how I do it, um, I have a YouTube on it where I taught what's in the booklet that I think we sold out of it, um, but I do have a method that I use that my husband taught me. Um, I use his method. I think it's very helpful. I, I put on, but just real quickly, put on with my own voice uh, on some type of recording system, whatever I'm memorizing. I use my phone now. 
uh, to record. I have a recording app, and I just record as fast as I can. Um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth without form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And I, so I put it on as fast as I can. So I, I put on Genesis 1, and then I'm listening to it. And the reason I do it fast is because they say your brain picks up things uh, quicker and easier. If you listen to something at a fast speed, then instead of a slow speed, your brain's not about not going to pick it up quite as as fast. But I also make a copy out of my Bible. Uh, so whatever I memorize, I you know put on the copy machine, and I take a, I uh, have with me and my folder in there. I have Genesis. Uh, six and seven and part of uh, Genesis 8 because on the plane, you know, as we circled for almost 30 minutes coming here and I kept thinking, why are we circling? We're not going anywhere. And then he said, we're going to Atlanta, not Orlando. I was like, oh, okay. So uh, while we're sitting circling over some cloud, I kept seeing the for this 30 minutes. I thought, well, I can be working on my memory work. So I just always have it with me. It folds nicely and I always have it with me and I do just like everybody else does. Um, phrase by phrase, you know, Paul and Apostle of Jesus Christ, or in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth without form and void, and darkness is on the face of the deep. So you have one done, then you go to verse 2 and verse 3, and you're always reviewing verse 2, 1, 2, and 3, and pretty soon you have the chapter done. And the key to remembering it, and this is what one somebody asked, how do I remember all of it, is review. Once I finish a book of the Bible, I try to review it every day for 30 days. Not the larger books, like Luke or Matthew but the smaller books, I try to review every day for 30 days. The larger books, I try to review when I finish one of the chapters uh, for every day for 30 days. And once you review it like that, once you review it for 30 days out loud, you can't just read it. You have to review it out loud. Um, you pretty much have it. And then I just have a review system where I try to review everything within a two-week period of time. So that's how I, and, and as I'm getting older, I find myself, I'll be saying, I'll be in one book and then I end up in another book. And I'm like, where is that passage? So I'm noticing as I age, you know, that it's getting a little bit harder to retain everything. But I'm going to keep doing it. I love it. And uh, it's been a joy. It's been the, one of the greatest joys of my life, actually, is memorizing. I think that was all. How do we memorize... Yeah, and how long did it take me? Oh, I started at 30, and I told you already. Okay, and I'm 65, if that tells you anything. That tells you a lot. So for <laughs> 30, 35 years, okay, that's a memory too. All right, and if I don't answer your question sufficiently, um, email me. I always say this, and nobody ever emails me about any questions, so, but I'm happy to try to answer. Okay, outwardly we get along with everyone, cause no divisions. When another woman is controlling or contentious, we respond calmly and with kindness and love. But then we notice that inwardly we can be resentful and have a critical spirit towards the other person. So how do we deal with this? Well, you've got to take, a, the, take care of the issue of your heart. And again, I would encourage you uh, memorize, to find some passages that would deal with that, the inner person of the heart. I know when I am uh, dealing with thoughts in my mind, either resentment, bitterness, uh, things like that, I'll rein my mind in. You know, Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. So you want to gird up the loins of your mind. You want to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Lord, I know that this is not a right thought. I'm thinking bitter thoughts towards this person. I would like to kill this person right now. And so would you help me? Help me. And then renew your mind with Scripture. That's what Paul says in Romans. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. And so you need to renew your mind with the scriptures. And so what I, I just make myself, I, I stop thinking that thought and I start thinking God's thoughts. What would God have me to be thinking right now? How can I be loving this person? How can I be uh, stopping this resentful, critical attitude? And so I would say that's the whole issue. You don't want to work on the outward, man. That's just legalism and Phariseeism. You want to work on the heart. And so the only thing that's going to transform your heart is how you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's not what you think you are. It's what you think you are. So you want to put on the word of God. How do you explain, how do you explain what a Christian is without getting in a dispute on how to get saved? Um, I just give them the gospel. I mean, if, they, if they're angry about it... Um, Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine or give holy things to dog. At least they turn and lacerate you. So, but you give the gospel. Uh, you don't have to be, you win them by your behavior, but also how you share with all humility and honesty. And you share the gospel. You, you point out their need for a savior, that they're a sinner, they need a savior. 
and uh, you give them the facts of the gospel, repentance, the lordship of Christ. And uh, if they argue, I would just stop. I, it's very difficult to share the gospel with someone who's argumentative. And it's very difficult to share the gospel with someone who doesn't even believe that the Bible is the word of God. So you're kind of doing what Jesus says don't do. Stop giving out truth to those kind of people. But pray and ask God to soften their heart and open the opportunity if that would be his perfect will. Is the doctrine of election a secondary issue? Um, I don't think so at all. I mean, there are so many passages on that. We're elected before the foundation of the world. Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and ordained you. Um, there's a, so many passages on, uh, Pax says something about as many, were, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Um, so there's a lot of passages on the doctrine of election. So no, I wouldn't consider it a secondary issue. I think it's a primary doctrine, uh, the doctrine of election. How do we create a women's ministry that's focused on learning about God? Well, <laughs> the Word of God. I'm sorry, when, when women's ministries, oh my. I get so many calls and emails about that. Women are sick of it. They really are. They're tired of the fluff. They're tired of going to these women's events, and it's no different than going to the bar with your girlfriends. There's nothing of substance. And so, uh, you know, the foundation for women's ministry cer certainly should be under the authority of the elders in your church, but it should be the Word of God. That doesn't mean you can't do other books. We, we do other books from time to time during the summer. We've gone through several books, but they're always approved by the elder board. But our elders have decided for our church that we will just teach the Word of God. Um, that's, a, that's what's going to help the women in your church. <laughs> Um, I would really encourage you not to have a ministry focused on what I call fluff puff. It's not going to help the women. And the women that I talk to that, that contact me, they don't like it. And they, they've quit going. They said, I've stopped going to our ladies, whatever it is, because I, I come home and I go, what was that about? <laughs> so, uh, ladies, you want your ministry. We, we also, at our church, we have a very active Titus II ministry. So we not only have the ladies coming for Bible study each week, but we also have women in the church that are discipling women. And so those, those kinds of things are going throughout all the week, too. And that's something that we're commanded to do is disciple others. So the one-on-one -on -one is very beneficial. And so we have the Titus II ministry and the women's Bible study. Philippians 4, who is yoke folk? You mentioned this near Clement. All he says is my companion. He doesn't say who it is. Uh, somebody must have been in, um, in somebody who was a companion to Paul in the ministry, but we don't have a name for that person. Is forgiveness to be unconditional in all cases? You know, that depends. Some people interpret Luke 17, if your brother repents, forgive him. So some people hold, Jay Adams was one who held to this view that forgiveness was conditional. The condition is if they repent. If they don't repent, you don't forgive them. The problem I have with that view is what, is, what did Jesus mean when he says, when you stand, pray, forgive. Our Father who heaven, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. And James says, if you don't show mercy, you won't be shown mercy. So I have a little bit of problem with that. Um, I do think that we, if you don't forgive, you risk the chance of bitterness and resentment and hatred and who knows what else. So, um, but I know there are some that hold to that view uh, that forgiveness is, is conditional. If my church has a female staff member who's occasionally giving a sermon, am I sinning by going to this church? Well, remember now, we might disagree, but um, Paul says, I permit not a woman to teach or usurp authority over a man. So, and it's talking about, remember 1 Timothy is talking about how you behave yourself in the house of God. So if a woman is standing up and preaching to a mixed audience, she is sinning. Are you sinning by going there? I don't know. Are you? For me, it would be wrong. I would not be able to do that in clear conscience. Um, so I would encourage you to perhaps find another church. If they're compromising in that area, more than likely there's other compromises. You might just not know about them yet. So you might be wise and prudent to sit down and talk with your pastor to find out what else uh, is going on there. 
What can I do as a wife if my husband is a believer but not a strong spiritual leader? I've been saved in church longer than him. You know, we, we had the first Peter 3. I think you do those things. You make sure those six areas are in your life, that you're not nagging him, that you're behaving properly, you're submitting, treating him with respect, and you win him by your conduct. Um, and I would pray. I'd fast and pray. Um, I have a, we have a lady that, well, never mind. I'm trying not to do this. Okay, never mind. I have ladies in my church that are watching this, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> What I say, I told Debbie, please remind me not to use anybody in our church as an example, because some of them are watching. Uh, so, but I do know cases where, where women have been married to unbelievers and have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and finally the Lord has saved their husbands. So don't give up. Don't ever give up on somebody, but keep living it in front of your husband. And I would find someone to disciple you, someone that can meet with you and encourage you and help you. Uh, hold you accountable for how you treat your husband and things like that. Okay, when speaking on the curses we've inherited, you mentioned not only pain and childbearing, but in conception. Would you mind clarifying? Yeah, this is one of the things. I mean, I've read Genesis I don't know how many times. But when I started memorizing Genesis, I, saw, I was memorizing. I said, what? I never saw that. Because, you know, when you have to think, you meditate, and, you know, you're going over and over, which is the Hebrew word for meditate. You murmur in a low tone of voice until it becomes implanted on your mind. So I was, I was memorizing that verse in sorrow in conception and childbearing. What? I, ch sorrow in conception, that's the conceiving process. But it, ma it made sense to me. And I'm talking to women, so... But as a biblical counselor and as somebody that tries to help people, I've counseled lots of women that have problems in that area of pain. They have pain in conception. And so I thought, wow, is that part of the curse? So I've been trying to do actually some study on it. I've been trying to read commentaries and, and Hebrew helps. And uh, so in my translation, that's what it says. Sorrow, not just in the birthing process, but also the conceiving process. So something that I'm mulling over now, I'm thinking about, but it is in the translation. So um, I don't know. So for some women, it could be a problem. And I, I've counseled women that have that problem. So I don't know. I, that's about all I can elaborate because that's all I know right now. But, you know, if you uh, know more than me, let me know because I think it's pretty fascinating to think about. How do you counsel women who are uh, in domestic marriage where they are physically abused or in danger? My ex-husband threatened me at gunpoint was physically abusive and arrested. Uh, when I counsel women who are being uh, physically uh, abusive, when their husbands are being physically abusive, I encourage them to usually go to a shelter to get out of the home. I usually, t first thing I tell them to do is call the police. If your husband is physically abusing you, even verbal abuse, at least in Oklahoma, uh, I don't know what, every state is different. But if the laws of the land are that the husband, even if he gets in your face and starts doing this, and I know women that happens to, I tell them to call the police. That's considered, at least in Oklahoma, I don't know what Florida's laws are, that is considered domestic violence. Um, so I encourage them to call police. If he's physically abusing, call the police. Uh, the laws, we are to obey the laws of the land. They are set there for us. Um, but if your husband is a Christian proclaiming to be a Christian acting like that, I would not only get the governing authorities involved, I would get the, you need to call the elders of the church. And, um, and if somebody in our church that was happening to, I would definitely, and a lady in my church would come and tell me that, and it's a husband that comes to our church, I would immediately, I mean, I'd tell my husband, and he'd be at their front door. So you need to get the elders involved as well. So um, that's what I would counsel. Happy Saturday. Well, happy Saturday to you. God bless you. God bless you too. Is there a way to get a complete list of acronyms? I have trouble writing notes and being able to retain them. Yes, I can uh, send them to you. If you'll email me, I will send you the acronyms. I'm assuming uh, you're meaning from the conference. You didn't get to fill them in fast enough. So yes, I can send those to you. Okay, and there was two questions on that. This Genesis passage where I said Adam wasn't with her, so there's two questions on this that your translation didn't say that. It doesn't. In the Genesis 3, 6 passage, it, sa it just says, if you'll read it carefully, all it says is, um, I'm not Genesis 3, 6, sorry. Um, I've got to find it here. 
Oh, and he said to the woman, and he said to the woman, uh, in, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 1, now the serpent was so, more subtle than any beast of the creature which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, you has, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So when I was studying this and looking at some of the Hebrew interpretations of it, one of the the commentators brought out that it doesn't say that Adam was there right there in verse one. And the Hebrew actually re reads the woman being alone. So, but then you're right in verse six, she ate and then she gave to her husband, but we don't know if there was space. Someone says, was there space between that from the time she ate and then gave to her husband? Well, if you take that interpretation that she was alone, as that one uh, Hebrew scholar said, then, you know, yeah, she was alone, and then she found her husband, and he gave, she gave it to him. So I wouldn't make an issue of it, but I do think that the principle is still the same. Where, why didn't Adam stop it? If he was there, why, was, why is there silence? Why didn't the serpent say to Eve and to Adam? Why, didn't he, why doesn't the Holy Spirit let us know that the serpent said to the man and the woman? He just says to the woman. And then you have the passages that I brought out in 1 Corinthians and the other that it was the woman who was deceived. Um, and so I wouldn't die on that hill, but those are just the research, the things I came up as I researched it out. Can you give us an update on your sister? Uh, I keep checking my phone. Uh, you know, as I said, she was fine on Father's Day. She said she sometimes feels a little nauseous. That's my phone going off. I don't. I thought I turned it off. Sorry about that. Um, you can just, yeah, throw it in the water, or I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, anyway, she was fine. She just said sometimes she, when she ate, she got a little full, and she felt a little nauseous. And but anyway, I got a call three days later, and she was in the hospital. Had blood clots in her lungs. She was bleeding internally. They had no idea what was going on, and so now she is. Uh, on a ventilator, oxygen, feeding tube, and her lungs are keep filling up. And um, so they diagnosed her stage four pancreatic cancer. Is she converted? Um, I don't believe so. My sister is, um, said would say she is, but I would say she's word of faith times 10. And um, so through the years, I've talked to her on several issues, so I would probably say no. But I am praying that while she's there in and out of consciousness, she's very heavily sedated, um, that the Lord would speak to her. So I don't know. I already have one brother in hell. So there's seven of us kids, and my brother died about, I think, four years ago. And the last thing he said to me was, don't pray for me. Because I said, I'll pray for you, Carl. And he said, don't pray for me. I'm like, all right. So anyway, I hope she is, but I'm not, I would not be 100% convinced of that. Um, there have been many in our church who have recently lost family members who were unconverted. Do you have any words of comfort in thinking through this big, biblically, uh, trusting the Lord through that sorrow? Yeah, it was hard. I tell you, the hardest one was my mother, because I'm not sure if my mother's in glory. I'm sure my dad is. I'm not quite sure of my mom. Uh, she unbiblically divorced my dad after 34 years of marriage, and her life after that was not uh, God-honoring. And so I did talk to her about her salvation and gave her some tapes, uh, or some, uh, back then it was cassette tapes, so that tells you how long ago, <laughs> on examine yourself, and she threw them in the trash, wouldn't listen to them, so I, I did challenge her, I said, Mom, you know, I don't even know if you're saved, I said, I see no fruit, no evidence, and, and so I did lovingly talk to her, um, and that was probably the hardest for me to deal with, and finally, after, um, she's been gone now 14 years, but it was very hard in the beginning when she passed because I, even talking to her best friend who was with her when she died in Russia, um, I asked her, I said, do you think my mom was a Christian? Because I said, you knew her probably more than anybody. And she said, I don't know. She said, you know, all the years we were best friends, we never once had a spiritual conversation. And she said with tears, I never confronted your mom. So I don't, I don't, I would say probably not. So I had to deal with that because it's your mom, you know. And so it took me a long time, but I finally worked through it. And I thought if my mom's, my mom being in hell is a way that God can glorify, be glorified. You know, some get mercy, some get justice. And I finally had to get past the fact that it's not about me. It's not about my mom. It's about God's glory. 
And Romans 9 is clear. He makes some vessels for the wrath, for wrath and some for mercy. Uh, some are fitted to destruction. Some are fitted to glory. So who am I? Who can say to the potter, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, right? So that, it's a hard. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy in our earthly flesh. It's hard, right? Um, so, but it is difficult. So, no, I don't know about my sister. I pray, and I even uh, wanted to send her something, but uh, my niece said she doesn't want anything. She doesn't want music. She doesn't want anything. She just wants quiet, so, uh, and she doesn't want visitors, so. Um, what does submission really look like for a single woman living alone in her late 30s? Um, that's a challenge for sure. I would make sure you have some accountability with an older woman that can help you. As a single woman, I would uh, make sure that if you have a decision to make, you would run it by your father or a pastor or elder. Uh, as a pastor's wife, I've seen single women through the years make some uh, unwise decisions, and they never sought counsel from anyone. So I would really encourage you, if you don't have a husband, uh, to talk to your father. Uh, who's older? I, when my husband had his stroke several years ago, um, and I thought we didn't, we thought he was going to heaven, but he didn't, and God restored him. But I thought, who, who am I going to go to now? You know, and I thought, well, my son. You know, my son is a pastor, and and I trust him. And so, if I needed some guidance or help, I would uh, talk to my son and get his guidance. So I would always have somebody uh, wiser and older than you that can help you. Uh, can you share some of your testimony? Um, yeah, I was saved and baptized four times the last time took. No. <laughs> That's the short version. <laughs> so when I was five, uh, my Sunday school teacher asked, who doesn't want to go to hell? My hand went up. I didn't want to go to hell. My, my dad taught on it, and I believed in it, and so I didn't want to go there, so I got saved and baptized. At 13, I went off to youth camp, had an emotional experience, got saved and baptized. At 18, I was in a car wreck driving my youth director's car. We were going to New Mexico for a mission trip. Right before the accident, I took my seatbelt off because it was uncomfortable. Told the lady next to me, this is uncomfortable. I'm taking it off. I was driving, and the car rolled several times into a ravine. We, my brother was in front of us in a van, and they held his head down because they didn't think I would live. And indeed, if I'd had my seatbelt on, I wouldn't have lived. The highway patrol said I would have died. So when the car landed upside down, where I was sitting was completely flattened, and I ended up in the second seat. So after that experience, <laughs> it was a very emotional experience to think you all, I almost lost my life. So <clears throat> I got saved and baptized again at 18. But again, my, uh, that was my third time. My life never changed. I was living one life at church because I was a pastor's daughter, so I knew the lingo. I knew what I was supposed to do. But at home, it was a to totally different. Um, that was when I was dating that boy that my, husband, that my dad said to stop dating. And um, so anyway... Um, I went off to Moody Bible Institute, where I met my husband the first day of school, and um, a year later we got married, but he almost called off the wedding the night before we got married, because he began to realize that there were some issues there. He, he thought that I was maybe not be a Christian, and I had temper and just a lot of things he began to notice in my life, but he married me anyway, and the first 10 years of our marriage were pretty bad, not because of him, but because of me. I wasn't, nobody was going to tell me what to do, and, you know, as he used to say, I'm going to put on your tombstone. She did it her way. <laughs> so that was kind of the first 10 years of our marriage were a little bit rough. And at the age of, I was almost 30, I was inflicted with very severe pain, and I ended up in hospital for two weeks, flat on my back, and then six more weeks at home. And so while I was laying there in a hospital bed, there wasn't anything back in those days like a cell phone. We didn't have cell phones. I don't even think I had a TV in my room. I was by myself, isolation, couldn't see my children, couldn't see my husband, only my doctor, who was an elder in our church, and <laughs> Christian man, who would always say, is everything okay spiritually, you know? So, uh, but anyway, laying there, I had to come, I had a lot of thinking to do, and I came to the acknowledgement and understanding that I, I really had to think about my life, and I was living a double life. So what I was at home was not what I was at church. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are. So at that time, I began the process, I think, of the regeneration. 
the birthing process, and I began to really begin to repent of my sin, and I can remember time actually, first time in my life I saw myself as a sinner. Um, I really wept and mourned over my sin, and it seemed like everything I'd ever done flooded in front of me. And um, I repented. I had to go to my husband. I had to go to many people and seek forgiveness. And uh, that's when my life changed. And that's when the things I used to do because I had to. It was a duty. That's just what pastor's wives do. I started doing for delight. And that's when God birthed me with a hunger for his word. And, uh, and the rest is history. So that was 35 years ago. And then my husband baptized me for the fourth and final time. So... <laughs> Anyway, but you know, it was kind of encouraging when, when, when uh, my husband asked me one time, he brought the subject of the rapture when we were dating, and I started to cry, and he said, he said, why are you crying? That's the believer's blessed hope, you know, the Lord's return. And I said, because that's all my dad talks about is Bible prophecy, and I don't want to hear it anymore. And uh, little did I realize when I studied First John, when John says, um, there is no fear in love, because perfect love cast out fear. Fear has punishment. And he's talking about that time we stand before the Lord and we will have no fear. Perfect love cast out fear. So it made sense. I was always terrified when people talked about the end times. I can remember as a little girl being terrified and even into my adult life until God saved me. And then that fear went away. And then I was studying first John. I was like, wow, that's why I was scared all those years. Because I was going to hell. <laughs> I should be fearful, right? But perfect love cast out fear. Fear has punishment. So that was really encouraging to me. So that's the, that's the, the gist of it. But I, I'm very sensitive to women who are brought up in the church. Um, they know all the lingo, but they don't know the Lord. So um, that's why, another reason I think I have a passion to help women. Before the law was given, how did people know they were saved? Oh, no. Before the law was given, how did people know they sinned? Well, we had that kind of uh, with our seduced sister. Remember, as soon as they sinned, they were they knew their eyes were opened, and they knew they were naked. So we were born with a conscience. We have a moral conscience, and so uh, the, they might not have had the law yet. They didn't have the Ten Commandments, but God birthed them, made them with a conscience, and so the guilt was there already. So they knew they had sinned. How do you know what church to go to? You can come to my church. <laughs> It's a good church. Um, you know, I, I have a couple of websites that I send to people on how to find a good church. But you want a church that at least practices the, the, the sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper, church discipline. Uh, I would find a church that preaches the Bible. I would not go to a church that didn't uh, preach the Bible. A lot of people, they, they preach and they might throw a verse in there, but they don't <coughs> preach the Bible. Uh, that's elder run, qualified elders not just a warm body to put in the position. They're qualified by Timothy and Titus. For me, if I was also looking for a church, the first thing I would probably do is go to the women's ministry uh, site on the website and see what they're studying. And if they're studying some wackadoodle, I ain't going to that church. <laughs> I'm, not go I'm not going. So, uh, so I would check a lot of things. And, I would, and you know what I would tell you, too? Go for three months. I, these people that try a church one Sunday, you can't know what a church is like for one Sunday. Go. Go Sunday morning, Sunday night. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Go to all the things and go for a good amount of times, unless you see right away, I can't go here for some reason. But really see what it's about. You can't know a church in one Sunday. So go for a while. How do we implement all this wisdom that we're, that we're learning when we go home? Well, I don't know. It's up to you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of women I know, they take extensive notes and they go home and go over them. And so I would do that. I, I wouldn't, you know, don't be just a hearer of the word. Don't be auditing this weekend. I hope you're not auditing this women's conference. That's what James says. Don't be a hearer. Don't be an auditor. To be a doer. So you have to make the choice when you go out those doors here in 15 minutes that you're going to think about all these sisters and what what did you learn? Maybe get with another sister here and say, hey, let's talk about the conference. What did you learn? What can I hold you accountable for? Uh, where are your weaknesses? Where do you see you're tripping up? Are you being seduced by the evil one? Are you serving? Are you using your gifts? Are you submissive? Are you squabbling? Is there anybody you're fighting with? Um, are you steadfast? Are you going through a trial? Are you going through it right? And then, you know, uh, hold each other accountable, pray for each other, help each other. Uh, that's the way to put into practice the things that you've learned. 
And uh, so that's what I would do. What habits and practices would you suggest a newlywed wife to learn that will now help her prepare for challenges down the road? Uh, discipleship, definitely she needs to be discipled. I would encourage her to read The Excellent Wife by Martha Peace. I would read Preparing for Marriage by Wayne Mack. Uh, I would learn how to be, um, if there's one thing, if there's several things I could do, would like to do over again, is learn how to be more respectful to my husband in the early years of marriage and more submissive because I just really, I challenged him on everything. I was not a good wife at all. That's why he said, I'm going to put on your tombstone. She did it her way. So, um, but I would, I really wished I had um, been better in those areas. So, my unconverted parents have told me not to come visit them until my husband and I get fully vaccinated. My husband and I are not getting the COVID vaccine. I feel hurt and sad for my children who can't see their grandparents. How do I respond in this situation and still honor my parents? That's very difficult. Um, whew, that, that's a hard one because, you know, we all have very strong opinions about COVID and about the vaccine. Um, and I have some very strong opinions, which you probably don't want to hear. My husband says you don't always have to express your opinion. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and I don't know what's going to happen. I've wondered if Deb and I are going to be able to continue to travel without getting vaccinated. We need the one have been vaccinated, um, and I don't criticize anyone who has. I think that's a, a conscious issue, whatever you feel is right to do. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. If I was in this situation, it would be very difficult for me personally because I don't know if I could personally receive the vaccine just in order to see my family. Um, it's going to be it would be very hard. Um, I maybe give it a little more time, maybe see what really fleshes out. Um, you know, now they're saying even if you've had the vaccine, you're going to need to get another one because of the new variant, the Delta variant coming around. So I, maybe give it a little more time, a little more prayer, give a godly, gracious appeal uh, to your children. Um, that, that's heartbreaking to me. Um, but I don't know, you have to follow your conscience on what you're going to do. But I certainly, I certainly hate to see that. I know people that have gotten it just so they could see their grandkids. Um, but for me, thankfully, my, my kids haven't made that an issue. I don't, I don't even think they, I've never asked my children if they got vaccinated. I don't think they have, but, but they would never make that an issue for us to see our grandkids. So that's hard. Pray fast. <laughs> uh, wait, be patient, and just see how it fleshes out. But I certainly would appeal. How do you respect a husband when he's high on pot and drunk? I respect him when he isn't, but I roll my eyes and I'm a disgusted when he is. He's not abusive. Um, you know, we're to respect our husband. We don't have to respect what they're doing. Okay? We respect the position, but we don't respect sin. So what I would do is um, when he's high on pot and he's drunk, I would find a way, since, especially since he's not abusive, I would just ask him, you know, do you mind if I do something different while you're doing this? I'm, you know, go to my room and maybe watch a sermon or uh, maybe go out with a friend. But I, I would just say, you know, I really don't want to be around this. I, lo I love you, but I, it's really difficult for me uh, to sit here and watch you do this. And I know you're hurting your life and your body and hopefully not our marriage, but um, I would just... I would just encourage him or ask him if it's okay if you just go do something else, that you would rather not struggle with resentment and bitterness towards him while he's sinning. So you don't respect the sin. You hate the sin, right? <laughs> but you still have to honor and respect him. So I'm, you know, that's a good way to do it. I, I really don't want to be here while you're getting drunk. So could, you know, I'd like to go out or go into my room, watch a sermon or read or whatever you like to do. And um, if he's a Christian, you haven't really said whether he's a Christian or not. Uh, I would be confronting him if he's a Christian. And, and if he doesn't repent, I'd follow Matthew 18 because drunkenness is a sin. Be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, right? So uh, wine is a mocker. And um, so I would definitely uh, begin, I would appeal to him, confront him, and get somebody else involved if he's a believer. My husband has spoken negatively about my appearance on a few occasions, and then other than plastic surgery, there's not much I can do to improve my situation. How do I balance between very attractive to him and not be too consumed with my outward appearance? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, yeah. 
I, if it was me, um, and again, I don't, oh, he is converted. Your husband is converted. Okay. And he's talking, well, since he's converted, um, I would, if it was my husband, I would lovingly talk to him about it. I would say, Doug, I think this is a wrong attitude that you have. I can't, this is the body God has given to me, and it's getting bigger every year in the middle, <laughs> and it's sagging, and I'm wrinkled, and I'm turning gray. I know I'm not the bride you married, you know, 46 years ago, but that this is a wrong attitude, that you, you should love me regardless of what my body looks like or my face looks like or anything like that. And I would lovingly talk to him and, and lovingly confront him that that's a wrong attitude as a Christian husband. He should not be looking at you like that in that way. Um, and on the other hand, I would say, you know, I would, I would as much as you can, um, dress in a way that pleases him. But uh, again, I, I would question... The motive of the husband, I'm not trying to be unkind or anything, but I would question the motive of why uh, he should love you the way that you are, and vice versa. Um, you know, you, we should love our husbands the way they are. That's the body that God has given him and us. So, um, but I certainly think if you can, dress in a way that's attractive to your husband and uh, try to honor him in that way. I know there was a long time when I used to have those, because you know I've been coming to this church, seems like forever and ever, I'm in. But there was a time I had a very short haircut. It was like a Dorothy Hamill haircut. And every time I'd come home, my husband would say, um, man, your hair sure is short. And I'd say, well, find a style and I'll change it. And you pick out one in the magazine and I'll change it. Didn't. Next time I got my hair cut, man, your hair sure is short. And I said, so finally I went through this for a long time, and I'd say the same thing. Well, honey, find a style that you like in a magazine. I'll, I'll have the hairdresser do it like that. So finally I said to him, very lovingly and respectfully, I said, Doug, we've been going through this now for I don't know how many years, and it's really getting hurtful and hard to listen to this every time I come home from getting my hair cut. So could you either find me a hairstyle or stop saying that? And you know what? He hasn't said it since. There's nothing wrong with that, being very respectful and kind. But you don't like my hair? Well, then find a hairstyle. I'll change it. I don't care. It's just hair, you know. But uh, so I think we, you know, sometimes women are fearful, but we're not to give way to hysterical fear. You can be kind and loving, but respectful and still lovingly admonish them. Uh, what is the difference between Christian fellowship and socializing? Focus on women's ministry. Well, fellowship is something we have because of Christ. It's a bond we have. We have fellowship with one another because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Socializing is just getting together and, you know, talking about whatever. Talking about chocolate, talking about, I didn't win any of those prizes. Uh, talking about our kids, our grandkids, the weather, COVID, the vaccine. You know, that's just getting together to socialize. Uh, but fellowship is because of the bond we have in Christ. And I would make your women's ministry focused on fellowship, not socializing. Even though there is a time for socializing. I, you know, I like to, I love to be outside. I like to do a lot of fun things, but um, it's very different than fellowship. Okay, uh, my husband has a disability, disabling illness that is affecting his cognitive abilities, ability to make sound judgment, physically declining. It's progressive, no cure. How does a wife follow God's plan designed for marriage, parenting, and life in this case, reality? Well, I think most of us are going to face this. When my husband had his stroke, uh, he couldn't cognitively think through issues. And uh, so I, he would forget things. He's getting much, much, much better. So the Lord has blessed him, and some of that is coming back. But, um, and I have friends whose husbands are getting all, I have a friend whose husband has Alzheimer's, another one who has Parkinson's, who's le losing his cognitive ability, and the roles may reverse. You may have to start making some decisions, um, and that's just the way it's going to be. You can't let him continue to drive. If he can't, doesn't know how to drive, he could kill somebody, and so you just have to lovingly talk to him, honey. You know, in God's providence, he's taking away your cognitive skills, and I'm going to have to start making some of these decisions. You can't drive if it's dangerous, and, and you, you've got to be careful. So again, lovingly, respectfully talk with him. Maybe you need to have a doctor talk to him. Maybe the pastor talk to him. 
Um, and it is hard. It's hard to reverse the roles. And I've, like, uh, my husband can't open th like this anymore. So before I leave home, and by the way, so you don't criticize me later, I'm traveling and speaking because this is what my husband wants me to do. I've offered many times to stop. And he says, no, the work of the Lord goes on. And he can take care of himself. He's not an invalid. He's still preaching every Sunday. But one of the things the stroke has done, he can't open bottles very well. So before I leave home, I make sure everything I know that he's going to need while I'm gone, I've already, it's had that first open. And I pretty much know what he does. And so everything is set up for him. So he's very capable. He drives. He does everything. And, uh, but there are just a few things that affect a little bit of his hands. And so I do all that for him, but, um, and I'm not taking over the headship. I'm just trying to be kind to my husband, try to serve him and help him, um, because he still wants me to be doing this. Okay. Uh, from time to time, I feel great guilt of past sins. When I pray, I look to Christ and I read scriptures. I'm comforted. I've confessed my sins to God and I ask him to rid me of this guilt. Is it necessary to confess to man? Uh, as it's too shameful to bear. Well, you know, the Bible says that, um, well, Psalm 51 says, when David wrote Psalm after his adultery with Bathsheba, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And so he's confessing it to God. Did he sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Did he sin against Uriah? Uriah? Yes, but Uriah was dead. So he couldn't go to him. But I think if you know that you've sinned against somebody, you know, if you've done something evil against them, um, then you need to ask their forgiveness. But you don't need to certainly, there's some things I think we should be guarded about talking about. Uh, especially in the uh, sexual area. I think we need to be very careful how much we give out, what, how much information we give out could be polluting to another person. We certainly need to confess our sins to the Lord, and it would depend on the what you've done, whether you need to confess to someone. If you've sinned against someone, as the Bible says, if you know, if you're, you have ought against your brother or your brother has something against you, go take care of it. So it would just depend. If you get angry at your husband, uh, you need to probably ask for forgiveness. I'm sorry I lost my temper. Uh, will you forgive me? So it depends on the nature of the sin. Um, but I don't think we confess all of our sins to all people. <laughs> I don't think the Bible ever says for us to do that. Some things are just best left unsaid. So um, could you please clarify your comment I believe you made last night about women taking leadership positions in government? From a biblical perspective, do you believe women should not hold those positions? What about churches and corporations? Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, all I was trying to, the point I was trying to make is it is natural for a woman to want to take over, whether it's government, um, church, the workforce. Women just want to take over. That was my point. Um, Deborah was a judge, so obviously, and there was a leadership vacuum when Deborah became a judge in judges. So, I mean, I don't think it's the best thing. For a woman to take a leadership position in government, but uh, I would not take that up but biblically. Um, I would think I, I think the best is to have men in leadership, uh, whether it's in the church, well, in the church for sure, um, and in the home for sure. And government, it would be I think the best. I think that's what we're seeing more and more: women senators, women congressmen, women running for president. I'm not saying it's a sin. I just don't think it's the wisest thing. Um, and what was the other one I said? I don't remember the, the other one. Workplace. Yeah. Well, I think women are vacating their responsibilities at home and going to work. And so uh, do I think it's wrong? I think that's another question here on women working. But um, anyway, hopefully that answers your question. How do you truly forgive when it hurts so much? Well, we've talked about that a little bit already. You have to change the way you think, and you have to go back to the the how much you've been forgiven. Uh, in the same measure, measure that Christ has forgiven you, you forgive others. How long did it take you to stop wanting to express every opinion you have? <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, yikes, my husband must be so tired of listening to my opinion. Not very long, because I really thought about what he said, and I thought he's exactly right. I, why do I think I have to always express my opinion on every issue? I think, And I had to realize it was prideful, so I stopped doing it. Okay, it's 3.30. I have a few more. What do you want me to do? Where are you, leader? Oh, leader. You want me to stop? If I haven't answered their question, they can... Uh, uh, okay, well, let me answer this one. This is a kind of fun one. <laughs> what difficult theology, doctrine, or viewpoint do you look forward to having clarified or fully explained in heaven? 
eschatology, <laughs> and the doctrine of election. So on that, we'll end. And if, you, if these I didn't answer, you can email me, and I will endeavor to answer your question. Thank you, ladies, so much for your time. God bless.